The following is a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levitt presents with Dr. Jeffrey Seif. Party shalom to all of you. Jeffrey Seif here. I'm pleased to welcome you to a special, special, special edition of Zola Levitt Presents. This is going to be a little behind the scenes to let you know what's involved in the manufacture of television. It's more than just a talking head attempting to wax eloquent, but rather when we come to Israel, and I'm coming to you from Israel right now, there's a lot that goes on in advance of it, much as there's a lot that's happening here on the ground in order to put together a program that comes replete with hopefully good Bible information, a good dramatic reenactments, taking it to locations all over the area. Couldn't do it without my friend Ken Berg, who's here right now as well, our producer who on this trip celebrates 50 trips to Israel, Ken Berg. <laughs> 50 trips, that's amazing, isn't it? Uh, I still remember my first trip, you know, every time I come, it's like my first time over here. I just, there's something about this land that it's like a magnet, it draws me. And uh, I love working here, I love working with you. And on this program, of course, we're, we're gonna get some behind the scenes uh, looks at some of the people who we, we deal with on a regular basis that the viewers are probably interested, I think, in seeing. We have this uh, great series coming up, which uh, you know about because you're very much a part of it, on Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. Yeah. And um, why don't you talk a little bit about that and I'll talk about who's, who's involved in that. Okay, you'll introduce Jesus. I'll introduce Jesus, but you, you know, talk a little bit about your vision for this series. Right. It's always a challenge finding Jesus and Ken got the perfect guy to represent him for us and he'll tell you about that. We in making a series have to ask the question prayerfully and carefully, Lord, what would you have us to do with the resources that are provided? What's happening in the world? What's happening in the word? And how can we get to work on the manufacture of a story that uh, will show some months after we begin the process? You know, a pastor can sense what's happening in the church and in the culture and goes into the study and prayer and comes out with a message on a weekly basis. Hopefully that's apropos, but we have to work the questions and uh, in order to produce a product that'll come out months later. It begins with prayerfully and carefully looking what are the stories. We thought that uh, uh, people were particularly concerned about evil in the present age. And so we looked at the Antichrist in a previous series wanting to lighten up a little bit and thinking that there may be some break in the dark clouds. We thought the culture might be in the mood to have something more inspirational rather than something riveting and, and, and somewhat terrifying. And so why not, <laughs> it's Christian television anyway, so why not do a story on Jesus? Uh, so many of us are so vexed about uh, present circumstances. I thought we'd do well to revisit the person of Jesus who's our savior and helper and shield, who was the one who says, I'll never fail you or forsake you, who's the one who says, I'll be with you always to the end of the age, who's the one who loves us and cares about us and has a great plan for our life. What I wanted to do was look at his uh, Sermon on the Mount, what I call Torah on the Top. And I wanted to unpack some of the particulars there of what Jesus wants from us because I think this sermon sums it up so well, what it is that he wants from us, and then what we can expect from him. There is that little promise in there that is so delightful where he says, if you seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, then everything else will be added unto you. Well, I didn't want to just preach that promise. I wanted to have a look at it, as well as all of the concerns that are packed into the Sermon on the Mount. And so, we worked it up into uh, 24 teaching segments, what amounts to eight programs. We picked various locations. We worked on various dramas to reenact some of the essential stories on the sermon. Uh, we think you're gonna love it. And when I say we, I, I really mean we, not me. I've learned this is a, uh, a corporate venture and so I couldn't do it without without Ken Berg and we couldn't do it without you helping us and we're really appreciative for that. You're not just helping us, hopefully you're helping the world to see Jesus and Jesus from a Jewish perspective. So there's something of an intro to behind the scenes. You want to weigh in on anything beyond? 
Well, to that point of, of showing the Jewishness of Jesus, uh, we thought it all the more important to have an Israeli who's, who's speaking in Hebrew, uh, very close to what it would have looked like, what it sounded like when Jesus was actually there. So after a search, um, we came up with Shahar, is the name of the actor, and we took him on location here in Israel where he gives this Sermon on the Mount. What was surprising to all of us is that Shahar is not a believer. But in the course of the producing of this program, uh, he had questions and he had great insights. And I think as time goes along, we're going to find Shahar comes closer to the Lord. Uh, we ask that all the, the viewers pray for him. He is very interested in, in, this, in this role and the person of Jesus. And let's take a look at him now. I really feel inspired to do work around re, the reconciliation of uh, around you know, Jew, Jews and Christians. That I, if I were to distill or to really put what is it that really draws me to work like this, is I do I do feel that there's an immediate extension and an immediate uh, closeness between uh, the two people. If I were to name three most uh, important texts that I think that are important and are a way to to uh, to lead one's life it would be Moses and the Ten Commandments Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount and the Constitution of the United States <laughs> a lot of the Christians uh, deal with the crucifixion but yet the sermon for me when I read the work and I read the word the sermon is the heart of the word the sermon has all the truth that one needs to, to, to follow the path if you look just at the man Yeshua Jesus he was uh, a de devout Jewish rabbi a scholar and he followed in his lifetime, he only followed the Jewish law. For me, it's always uh, my Christian friends in America, I always tell them, if you really want to experience Jesus, for instance, come with me to Passover, because that was his final meal. Or no, to really tap into the source of where his ideas or where his being comes from, to fully understand that you must dive into Judaism. I mean, there's no way around it. And the fact that that's being hidden, kept away from most Christians is, uh, is you know, it, it's sad. But I think that now there's, there's an opening. I think we're at a new age now where many, many Christians, Gentiles in general, uh, could bridge and, and follow the real man and what he practiced. By doing so, they would get closer to the essence of, of, of God. Shahar is a great guy, isn't he? And I know you're blessed through his ministry here in this program. I'm thrilled to be able to come to you as a Jew who believes in Jesus and thank you for getting behind me and helping support the testimony of looking at the Bible from a Jewish perspective. It's a dream for me to be able to do that. I've served as a Bible and ministry professor for 20 years and now here. And speaking for years and years, uh, uh, my producer, our producer, Ken Berg, has worked 30 plus years uh, teaching the Bible from a Jewish perspective on the other side of the lens. Uh, comes from a ministry family. Uh, your mom, all of her sisters were married pastors. Your father was an Assemblies of God clergyman, the first Assemblies of God chaplain in World War II, correct? As he was. A strong ministry yes. family. Yes, raised in a wonderful Christian home. But you know, Jeff, even um, even though I was raised in a Christian home, I never understood my Christian root, my, my Jewish roots of Christianity until working with this ministry and Zola Levitt. Uh, first time I came here to Israel, like I said, I was just uh, galvanized by what was here. And the pieces began to come together in, in a way they had never had before. So um, although I do have the Christian background, I feel I'm part Jewish now too after these many years in Israel and working with was most, all on now with you both. Most Jewish people in a lifetime never come to Israel 50 times. Well, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it is amazing. I, I just can't believe it's been 50 trips. Of course, that's over 30 years. You right. know, so that's about averaging, I guess, two, two trips a year, something like that. So um, it's, been, it's been great. 
And you know, every series we do, thank, we really have to take time to thank the viewers for, for this because they are the source of our being here. They are the source of the production value that we try to bring to the program. And we really do try to raise the bar with each series that we do, make each one a little bit better. And I think this one coming up on, on Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount is the best yet. And um, I have to attribute a great deal of that to the local people that we work with. Elias Sidis is a local producer here in Israel that I've worked with for many years. I love the guy, he's like a brother to me, and uh, I'd like, to, like you to hear a little bit from Elia at this point. 99% well, of my work is for production from abroad. I work with National Geographic of various films almost two a year. I work with Channel 4 and BBC, the underwater film, the desert film, nature conservation, a lot of history and archaeology. Work for PBS uh, with Nova, Discovery, uh, with uh, you know, there's so many of them, with the Italian television, doing feature films. But there's nothing like working with this production. I mean, this, because this production actually, it's, when I said I'm working, it's not myself. I'm working with a team of people, which is the best group I ever had. It's the people that we became friends and we work together. And we meet together even after this production is over. We meet each other as friends. It's, it's, I would call it as a, it's a family production, actually. We are a family that's doing something together, and it's the best team I ever worked with, and it's the best results we get out of it, as a family act together to create something that they believe in. We work on a very low budget, and yet we reach a very high uh, production value, because we do it with love, with passion, and in a way we feel that we are in a message, we are in a, in a mission, actually, to tell this story. There's not much money opposed to other production that I've been working and I'm still working with uh, foreign production that are doing films in Israel. It's a very tight budget, but we do it, as I said before, with a feeling of we deliver ourselves and we bring the idea of, of uh, carrying the story and bringing it to you people that watch it and donate money for this program, which we use every cent for just to get the best production value we can get out of it. And it's very important, it's, you keep the flame and the fire burning with, with this. And uh, any other production will probably cost ten times more to do it, but we, we do it with, with a lot of love, which is the most important part, I think, with love. Pre-production, I think, first and foremost, um, starts with communication. Trying to, to communicate across continents what it is that, uh, that you would like and, and, and what's the feel you want. Um, and then together we try and find a solution to, to say what it is that you want to say within constraints of budget, distance, number of extras, etc., etc. Sure, sure. So it involves a lot of uh, uh, searching for locations, uh, a lot of uh, playing around with different ideas until we, we sort of settle on what's, what's going to work and what will be viable. <coughs> As always, you come up with a challenge. And uh, we, we try and uh, accommodate, and uh, we try and do it within a very strict budget, recycling from one program to the other. Sometimes a palace turns into a boat, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes a vineyard uh, becomes uh, an altar or whatever. A lot of it is, is uh, guesswork and intuition, and uh, thank God that we have biodegradable materials and no one can prove us wrong. Fishermen, I don't think we're affluent enough to, to afford a carpenter to build a, a wooden boat and, and it's not the kind of knowledge that any fisherman would have. Whereas reed boats we use from Turkey down to Mesopotamia. <laughs> but we, we, try to, we try to be, no, really, we try to be, where there are not answers, we try to see that whatever we're doing is, is actually functional and it's probably the solution that would have been reached having the tools and, and the materials of those times. And, and living that is, is fun. I mean, we have dedicated crew and people that work well together and we, we've been working together for quite a number of programs now, which makes us that much more efficient. And uh, we enjoy what we do. So if we're not having fun and we're not doing Hollywood, as you say, yeah. then why bother? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, always, we always wanted to have a, a dolly, which is, gives the ability to put a camera in motion, which makes everything look just so much better. But never had the budget to afford a dolly and a crew and the truck and everything that's needed to come with it. 
So we bounced around the idea of perhaps making one by ourselves and uh, we found on the internet a design for what's called a doorway dolly, uh, which is simply like roller skates on a board connected to two pipes. Um, before that we, we tried using a wheelchair, which gave us sort of limited success. But uh, we went ahead and we built a dolly which cost us all of three, four hundred dollars, which is a lot out of our small budget. And uh, our cameraman Jerry had uh, input how to improve it and from uh, show to show we added length and added supports and uh, we think we've got it down now and uh, we have our own dolly. Um, actually I feel uh, blessed to yeah. be part of the team, part of the staff, wonderful staff. And um, actually this is my first uh, um, contact uh, personal contact with uh, the Christian's idea uh -huh. as a Jewish girl who born in Israel I'm Israeli and I just learned stuff and what amazed me about um, the concept of this film that uh, the bottom of line all of us believe in the same uh, issues. I, I raised in a very orthodox family and my father is a really a Hasid. Yes. Yeah, with a beard and uh, the typical Jewish guy. <laughs> yeah. and, and when he was a child, he was raised by Christians. Um, wonderful people who saved his life in the Holocaust. And I'm here because of them, actually. And to see you all come here and to tell the story of Jesus and uh, his Jewish source and his connection uh, to God and his special saying about uh, human being, about belief, about to be a good person inside and outside. And it, it, it's really, yeah, I'm, I'm speechless. What? Actually, Shachel told me that um, the story you're trying to bring in this uh, um, movie, the story of Jesus before he became a Messiah, you say? What? And I, I remember the scene that... Um, we're turning around the house oh, yeah. and um, the thing is we don't have to look around we just have to knock on the door and the answer just there and in Judaism we have the same thing <laughs> and I think that that's the point that's the most uh, important thing that uh, I'm taking from this uh, experience. Great. Yeah. Actually, it's going to be a scene um, about uh, fishing village. We're going to see a lot of fishes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, very nice. We are on, on the beach of the Kinneret. I think it's really important to just know that some of uh, Christians really care about his source. And because um, many of us, I know, for example, me, <laughs> um, I didn't know that the Christians cherry um, his, his Jewish, Jewish source. And this is totally a surprise for me. You're going to now be introduced to Danny Carmel, a fascinating individual a Jewish guy who came to faith in the Lord, a boat captain actually on the Sea of Galilee. He must have had one too many trips. He ran into so many believers who loved the Lord and loved Israel. He figured if you can't beat them, join them. Well, he did. He came to faith through you and through your visits. We're gonna hear from him and then you're gonna hear him minister in song. My name is Daniel and uh, I'm a believer from Galilee and you are actually on the only boat that belongs to believers on the Sea of Galilee. I met the Lord during my work as a boat captain here on the Sea of Galilee. I've been working here for 15 years 
And uh, two years ago, the Lord allowed me to bring this boat into the lake and uh, to start this uh, company, Sea of Galilee Worship Boats. Um, I was born in 1964 in Haifa. And my mother was a very young Orthodox Jewish girl. She was only 15. And she was forced to give me up for adoption. And then I stayed in Haifa with my adopting parents, the best parents on earth. <laughs> And uh, I grew up like any regular kid. After the army, I fell in love with the sea. And then I went to marine school. And when I graduated, I found a job in Haifa port. At the, at the age of 28, I have decided to open the files of the adoption and to find my birth mother. And I found her right here in Galilee. And uh, besides her, I found also four brothers and sisters. Mm. A year after that, I just left Haifa and I came over here to live in Galilee. Of course, my parents and my adopted sister is, uh, was a part of the picture. We became a big family all together. And I was looking for a job. And the only job that I could find here on the Sea of Galilee uh, was on the Sea of Galilee boats. No other choices as a boat captain. And um, since the first day I was working on the Sea of Galilee, on the sea of Galilee boats, I was uh, exposed to the Word of God every day. I heard the good news. Hallelujah. <laughs> I had the teaching. I had the worship. But most of all, I could feel the presence. And that's what drew me in. Five years after I started working here, I just woke up with great love to Yeshua. And then I have started my uh, worship ministry. And I have translated very popular worship songs to Hebrew. And I did it for two reasons. First of all, I did it for the people of Israel. You know, most of them don't know Yeshua. And uh, music is a very good instrument to draw people. You know, Hebrew is the first language. Hebrew is the language of the Lord. And personally, I believe that each and every one of us will have to know a little bit of Hebrew, either it's here or up there. And music is a very good instrument to learn languages, you know. And that's why I, why I did it. I want everyone to know Hebrew. We sing here, actually, live worship, half Hebrew, half English. And it's a... Uh, the most meaningful time, I think, uh, in all of the tour to Israel, to be on this sea and to worship the Lord with us. From the time I found you, the first time that I met you, I knew you were the one, the, the one I had been seeking. Mighty God El Shaddai, living King who reigns on high, the lover of my soul. In you, I found my healing. I love you, Lord, I worship you, I will live before you, oh hallelujah, for the wonders that you do, I praise your name, oh Lord. Coming to you here from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and behind me is a call to prayer from the minaret. For Muslims, it's a very special day today. They believe that this is the day when Muhammad made a night flight to Jerusalem and from the Al-Aqsa Mosque here ascended into heaven. That's not quite my understanding, but it is theirs. I understand that no one ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who said that if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto himself. 
And in this program, we endeavor to do that with you as an extension of your love and your affection for the Jewish people. We want to lift Messiah Jesus up in the world and thank you for helping us to do that. I must say, as a representative of a nonprofit organization, that along with many other charitable organizations, the, uh, it's been a really tough year and it's really put a lot of pinches on us. We, uh, thanks to our uh, executive director, Mark Levitt, uh, went on producing anyway. He didn't want to pull back the throttle. He said, let's get that story out. And we've expended a lot of resource to do it, but we really need your help now to continue on the journey, please. If you believe that this is Christian TV worth watching, and I, I trust that you do, uh, even if you can't do a lot, I think if a lot of us just do a little together, we can get through this. We can get by with a little help from some friends, friends like you. And speaking of friends, there's a whole new venue that's cropped up in the world called social networking. And if you would be so kind as to consider posting our ministry on your Facebook and telling your friends and sending it out, hey, watch this. These guys have a story of Jesus coming out that's second to none. If you'd help us to tell the story, we surely would be greatly appreciative not just we, certainly, you know, every preacher looks for some help with church work, uh, but I think the Lord himself, believing as I do that the harvest is plentiful but the labors are few, I'd like to ask you to help, you, to help us to please um, make Jesus known in the world. I believe that if we do that, if we seek first his kingdom and take care of his kingdom business, that he has a really special way of helping us with our own. In this program, hopefully you've gotten some sense of there's some quality people working on this. It's a quality endeavor. We want to take Christian programming to a whole other level. But maybe you've heard the saying, the bigger the levels, the bigger the devils. And it costs millions. I don't want to trouble you with the pressures that I bear, but please help us if you can do so. What a time, the time is now. So take it as a challenge. If you can't, we'll take your prayers alone and God knows we're appreciative of that. But if you can put some cares attached to those prayers and pick up a pen and write us a check to help us with our work or to uh, post us in your social network and encourage others to have a peek our way, we surely would be greatly appreciative. Love you in the Lord either way. Millions of people are being touched by this ministry. Not millions are supporting, but listen, it's great to be in the Lord's work, together partnering with you to make his name look good in the world. From Jerusalem here now on the Mount of Olives, I just want to say thank you and keep on the ready for what's coming up for you are going to see a series, Sar Shalom, the Hebrew for Prince of Peace. We trust it'll bring peace to you. Speaking of which, as we go now, as we always say, Zola did in his day, Sandra and me to follow, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.